everyone. I hope you're doing all doing well today. Uh, my name is Jonathan LeBlanc, and I'm a developer evangelist with X Commerce out in uh, San Jose. So today, what I'm going to go through are just some of the major top five tips for building viral apps and sites through some of the emerging technologies that I cover in my O'Reilly book, Programming Social Applications. Now just to give you a little bit of context, I've been working with partner integrations and evangelism for uh, probably five years now from um, my time here at XCommerce in the developer evangelism group, my uh, three, three and a half years within the Yahoo developer network where the majority of this content comes from. And then work I've done uh, building social applications uh, when I was working with CBS Sports. So the, so the content today that we're going to be going through is all on a programming, a programming social applications. So we're going to cover a lot of the open source technologies that are, are just great foundation technologies for, for building these, these applications. Uh, the, um, the, the majority of this book does cover open source because I find it's a great learning tool. I, we could have covered a lot of proprietary approaches. We could have uh, gone through Facebook and, and some of their implementations, but, but really what I found is that open source as a technology uh, or as a technology group allows people to really explore everything there is behind social application development and behind authentication, authorization, or any particular technology that the group wants to push. And so, the one thing I need to preface here, definitely need to preface, is a lot of people in the open source world tend to say that open source is, is a be-all, end-all for, for technology. I'm definitely not of that approach. I, and I like to always state that open source, uh, open source initiatives, open source technology is really the great foundation for a good good program or a good authentication system. It will show you everything that you need to know about these particular technologies and get you 90% of the way, but in the majority of cases, you'll have to integrate it into your systems, might have to make some tweaks, but it's a, an amazing technology for learning. And if, when you're actually going through this tech and implementing it, uh, getting 90% of the way and learning at the same time is quite an advantage. What we're going to go through today as the top five principles are just a few of the core, uh, core lessons that I've learned over the past couple of years uh, in partner integrations and, and uh, doing these, uh, these outreach uh, events and, and conferences. So first and foremost, we're going to take a look at how to use social graphs, um, which I'm sure most of you have heard of, and then the more recent iteration on entity or interest graphs. So as opposed to social links person to person, an interest or entity graph has links from a person to things, things they like or uh, things that they're interested in. It brings a lot, a lot of re relevant information about the user from that. Then we're going to take a look at sharing models, how to integrate early, why you should integrate early, and, and really what, um, what social sharing models you should be watching out for in the industry and uh, when you're trying to pick an outlet channel. Then we're going to take a look at um, why you should be using the work that other companies have already put, invested, why you should be leveraging off of all of the great initiatives that they're building uh, when you're building out your products or leveraging off data on the web. And then we'll jump into how to build for all available outlets. And I'll give, definitely give you some examples here on, on the reasons why you would want to build for any available outlets um, or views or uh, different sites. And then finally, we'll end up with uh, how to use emerging social technologies in order to make your lives easier and better and your programs better. So let's start out at the top with uh, how to utilize that social and interest graph. <clears throat> so first what we're going to do is jump into a, a quick poll. I want to see what, uh, what the audience has to say about this and really, um, really interested in, in the social outreach that you're currently doing. So uh, when do your companies actually integrate social outreach channels into your products? So feel free to, uh, to vote. All right, let's let's jump over and, and 
see. Ah, added as needed. Yeah, see, that's the majority of the time when I am uh, working with customers, working with developers. The uh, what I normally see. Oh, here, I'll push this to all of you so that you can see that. One sec. Let's go ahead and push poll results. Okay, perfect. So now you can see what's the what the particular votes were. Um, a, a quick jump over, but um, the, basically the votes covered basically what, what I've seen in the past years of development. And and what that is is um, the majority of development into um, adding social features into an application is usually done as needed. It's not really thought of as an integral part of application development. But the majority of the outreach that you're going to get from users is, um, is definitely from your social outreach channels. So let's go ahead and take a look at the first on our list, which is building those relevant social graphs. So what we can see in front of us is, is really just the epitome of what a social graph is. When we're thinking about it, it, what we normally see from Facebook or large-scale social networking companies is this large interconnected network of people. And that's a really good way of thinking about it on a large scale. But if we break that down to its base level, all it really is is simple links from a root person to other persons or things. So we'll have a root person, and then if they have a direct like or a direct uh, friendship, a direct person that they're involved with, then that's called a direct relationship. Now, those people might have friends that might not be friends with the original person, and those are indirect relationships. And it keeps going and going and going uh, as you build out that graph. And now, all of these are interconnected by social links. And this is really the, the core foundation of, of a social graph, the, everything that you really need to know in order to understand that interconnected web. <clears throat> so when we're actually talking about that, that social network, that social graph, what are we really looking at here? And those, those features are all around relationship models. So relationship models, in short, are really just ways of thinking about how people form relationships on any particular site or service that, that they're interested in. First off, we have the follower model, and Twitter's a prime example for this, and really the, the, this type of model is viewed as a person following another person or a person subscribing to another person, really just seeing their overall uh, tweets or their overall opinions. And those opinions and tweets may be, uh, <clears throat> may be completely public. You know, on, uh, with the Twitter model, almost everything is public unless you go ahead and protect your tweets. But for the most part, it's, it's all public knowledge. It definitely provides a security risk with, um, with people oversharing details and not having fine-grained control over, um, over the information that they're, they're publishing. But for a user, it's, it's, uh, and for someone leveraging off of this type of model, it's really great because you have such a huge audience to, to push out content to. Next, we have the connection model, and Facebook is a great example for this. <clears throat> the traditional model for Facebook is um, behind one-to-one uh, -one relationships or direct friendships uh, or reciprocated friendships. You make a connection, and you, that person accepts that connection, and then you guys are tied together. In doing so, you're basically stating to the application uh, platform that you trust this person enough to view your details, or at least a portion of your details. Now, the, where the follower model might have this huge outreach, the value behind, behind the connection model is that you have very rich, relevant connections or, or people that you, you have relationships with. Now, if you're pushing out a product, you really want to get people to, to come view your site or service, the connection model has all the relevant details that you're going to want to leverage off of. And these people are more likely to click on one of their friends links than someone of the follower model who are just publishing content. Finally, 
finally, we have the group model. You can see this within Google Groups, Yahoo Groups, uh, even the, uh, the Google Plus, um, the um, uh, circles, as well as the, uh, the new <clears throat> smart list that Facebook has, has pushed out. These are all prime examples of the group model, where people can form groups or lists based on, on um, you know, family, friends, coworkers, and <clears throat> The core behind this is is really that um, you're just trying to bucket users in order to pre to present them with different types of content or restrict them um, based on certain access rights. And at a very base level, this is a very easy concept to understand. You just automatically create your buckets, much like the Google Plus uh, circles. But the complexities in this type of model come into play when you start doing this automatically. When you start really taking a look at human relationships, and let's say, me to my family or me to my friends, uh, me to my coworkers, and, and realizing that certain content that I'm producing, I might want to send to my friends, but not my family. And the complexities behind here are really that, uh, that of human relationships. So in order to understand this type of model at a, at a very core level, you have to understand how human relationships work. And uh, we've seen a lot of problems in this type of in industry. Smart lists is, is actually, uh, within Facebook, is taking a, a, a small approach. So they're uh, trying to automatically bucket users, but um, then we see other big failures in the industry like Google Plus when they decided to push more relevant content from a person or more private content from a person to people that they communicate with the most. And the people that you communicate with the most might not necessarily be the people that you want to, that you want to connect with. All right, so now that we've taken a look at those types of models, let's go ahead and explore a relevant example. Um, and I'm going to be doing this throughout each of the sections, just providing you with a, a direct idea of, uh, of a partner integration request that I've had in the past, and just showing you, showcasing really what, uh, what the issues that might arise are. So when I was working at the Yahoo Developer Network, one of the major companies that we worked with to integrate onto the Yahoo application platform was Zynga. We did so in, um, as our first round partners, their first round game partners in 2009. Now back then we had just launched the platform and implemented a lot of security procedures on top of it. So when Zynga uh, launched, the connections that a normal user would have, so one user on the platform would have one connection. That was our, our average model. So it's definitely not a rich social graph. It's definitely not a relevant social graph. Now when Zynga uh, launched Mafia Wars, anyone that had Mafia Wars installed, their connections went from one to one up to one to 50. So every single person on, that had Mafia Wars installed automatically had 50 or more contacts. Now, it's great for Mafia Wars, but because they're building relevance within their game, these are relevant connections for them, but in, in a social graph, they're completely useless because these are people that just don't know each other. They just found each other to play the game. So they don't really have that same trust relationship that you have usually within this one-to-one -one connection model. So, we've, uh, so what happened was since we didn't have the core social graph in place, Zynga's integration failed because they weren't able to get that, that trust relationship, those people that are pushing out to their friends and family and, and having them install the game, much like you see on, on Facebook's model. So they weren't really getting the relevance that they, that they needed. Now, I mean, as, uh, to counteract that, we did a second integration with, with Zynga, uh, launching a revision to Mafia Wars, uh, Fish Fill, and, uh, and Zynga Poker. Uh, this was late 2010, early 2011, and what we were seeing was a much higher rate of installs because our social graph became more relevant at that point. We had about a year and a half uh, since the initial integration, and we had people with more connections. So they were seeing a steady increase of users over time because they were able to push out to the relevant users. <clears throat> All right. So let's take a look at one of the great technologies that 
ads can help you increase social relevance over the web so that you're not just staying within the bounds of your site or service. Webfinger is one of the amazing technologies I talk about in Chapter 10 of, uh, of the book. It's one of the ones that I found, I found around uh, in the past couple of years, and uh, it really had some interesting concepts. What it wanted to do was provide a mechanism for, for sites and services to be able to bring relevance back to email address, address, addresses. So what some of you might already know is that there was this concept of a finger protocol way back when. And what you could do with the finger protocol was say finger your, your email address and what it would do would be to provide you with, um, with server information and user information, basically a public profile based on your email address. So if I had that email extension, I would just pull that, that site your service and then it would provide me with whatever information I want to provide in my overall profile. Now, finger protocol uh, obviously failed because it's not used today. But in in the ashes of the finger protocol, that's where the web finger became found its foundation, and it's really just to bring relevance back to email addresses through social profiles and social linking. The way that web finger works is you'll have an application or service. The application or service will connect to, let's say, yahoo.com or google.com and perform a discovery on, on the uh, user's email address saying, I want to look up information for this user. The service will say, yes, that is a valid user and send back that public profile. It's really the same ways that the finger protocol is used. Now, the way that we actually do this in reality is twofold. First, what we have to do is perform discovery on the particular email account or the email holder. Let's say Gmail. <clears throat> Within Gmail, they have what's called a well-known hosts meta file. So under the URL that you can see at the top of the slide, the dot well-known slash host meta, this is where you perform discovery on Yahoo or Google or any email provider if they host WebFinger as a technology. And what you're going to get back is this XRD document, which embeds this link within it to WebFinger. And the query at the end is simply this URI that you can plug in the email address for the user. Now, using, uh, using that URI and making an, uh, another curl request to it, so let's say I curl that with my Gmail account, what I'm going to get back is a huge XML document containing a lot of information about me. But at a very base level, some of the core concepts that you're going to get back are the user profile. Uh, so a profile to my Google profile, in, in which will redirect to Google Plus now. The portable contacts link, so I can get my contact information directly from there. And then my Google BuzzFeed. So that's just a, a few of the pieces of information that you can leverage off of with the WebFinger protocol. It's definitely an incredible, incredibly useful utility in something that's, that's emerging in, in the space. Whether it succeeds or not is you know, up to the implementers, but seeing technologies like this that are trying to bring social relevance to every aspect of your online lives is quite a, quite a feat. It's really nice to see that the entire web's becoming socialized based on your user profile details. So now that we've gone over the, um, the social and interest graphs, now let's take a look at, uh, at sharing models. And sharing models are really how you're going to drive relevance back to your site or your service, really increasing those viral channels through sharing. Now, when we talk about these sharing models, we definitely have to have a note here about real life versus online social graphs because there's a huge difference. What you can see in front of you is the idea of the real life graph. And in our real lives, we don't have this, this huge interconnected web where everybody's a friend to everybody and everyone shares the same content. We bucket users automatically within our heads, within our relationships, or, or however we choose to automatically. So I might bucket my, my coworkers who, who don't know my friends, who don't know my family, and, and we form these individual buckets. 
You might have some leak over from coworkers to friends, but for the most part, we work by clustering users into things into groups that make sense to us. But this is completely divergent from the from the online profile and from the online social graph, because there, there's really no concept of grouping. And this goes back to that group model. If we can find a way to group users and group people that we know online automatically based on a relationship status or, or my particular uh, relationship status with, with other people, then that's where the real relevance is going to come into play. That's where we are going to have a true link between our real and, and online social graphs. All right, so when we break this down, the sharing, the types of sharing models that you're going to see 99% of the time on sites and services, and these are services that you can leverage off of in order to push new activities to and feed people back to your site or service, is uh, two, there's basically two models. First off, we have the opt-in model. Now, the opt-in model is really great for security of users because what it means is a user will go to a site or service and before sharing any content on their behalf, like let's say you want to push out an activity on their behalf, they have to grant the application site container the access rights to post to their activity stream. Now, again, it's great for user security, but when you're trying to build viral growth of your application, you're going to see far less traffic coming from your site in, in a site or service with this type of model because they, you'll have far less traffic coming through. Now, the, on the opposite end, you have the opt-out model. By default, someone who's using a service like this is going to have to opt out of sharing. So by default, they'll go to the site and their site will automatically be able to share things on their behalf, so share to their wall. And this is going to drive a lot of viral growth back to the site or service that, uh, that's hosting the activity. And that's exactly what you want. So with these in mind, you can see all the different outreach channels that you might have with different sites or services, whether that be Twitter, whether that be Facebook. And Aiming for opt-out model products is really where you're going to see an increased in viral growth. What you ideally want is a very relevant social graph and a, a very easy way to publish, publish to the user stream. Now, let's go ahead and take a look at a use case of this. And it's, it's on the negative side, so definitely a negative side of the opt-out model. And that's the oversharing application. We all know this, we've all seen this. The oversharing applications tend to um, basically overshare content. They will push as much content as they, as they can to a user stream. So let's say you have an application on Facebook and you've granted them access to post activities to your wall. Well, some of those, some of those websites will have integration or some of those services will have integration points where based on most of your activity, they're going to share something to your wall. This is a horrible use case for on many different reasons. First off, if you engage in methods like this where you push out as much content as possible, you're most likely going to hit one of three results. The user is going to delete your updates, uh, the updates to their stream. They're going to delete your application, which nullifies your outreach channel or their friends and their connections will hide those updates or all updates from your application uh, or hide all updates from that person, it's significantly cutting off those outreach channels. So you need to be very careful about how much content you push out. All right, now let's take a look at some of the technologies that can help you share out to new sources. One of the emerging technologies on the market is called PubSub Hubbub. It's basically a PubSub model that uses a centralized hub in order to push content from a publisher to a subscriber or a series of subscribers. The way that it works is, you, first off, you'll have a subscriber that says, I want to access, um, basically I want to access some content on the publisher site. Publisher published out, let's say, some new comments from users or some new content. And 
the subscriber wants to capture that data. So they'll pull the publisher and get that data back. But the publisher, in, uh, as well, will send content back to the subscriber saying, oh, hey, I have this centralized hub that you can subscribe to, and whenever I have new updates, I'm going to post out to the hub, and that will notify you when there's new updates. And so instead of the subscriber needing to always pull the publisher on a regular interval, you can just uh, subscribe to that hub and get the data back. So the way that this will look, is, look like is the subscriber will make a request to the hub saying, I want to subscribe to the feed. The hub will in turn send back this almost a challenge request or, or a verification request, and then the subscriber will verify their, so, their social link, their link to the hub to get data on their behalf, basically pu pushing an endpoint through where the hub can communicate with the subscriber to push new content. So when the publisher has new content that they want to post out, they'll push that to the hub. The hub will in turn say, okay, I have these list of subscribers I need to post these, uh, these comments or these new updates to, and they'll just push that data out. Now, what's really amazing about this is that now you, don't have, you, you significantly drop the amount of traffic coming to your site to, to leach off the data, and you can control things like commenting flow. So let's say a publisher has a comment thread that they want to utilize or, or want to share with different sites or services, they can use the pub sub hubbub model in order to uh, push these comments through. So now all the subscribers have the unified comments from the publisher side. But it doesn't work the other way. We don't have the model for pop up pop up or the specification does not work from the subscriber to the publisher. But that's where another great technology comes in, called the salmon protocol. Now I was wondering when I had first looked at this, why why would they name it the salmon protocol? It's such a silly name. Until I really thought about how salmon work. Right, so they'll swim upstream to their spawning grounds. And that's exactly how the model works, how the specification works. So PubSub Hubbub pushes from publisher to subscriber. Salmon works upstream the other way, subscriber to publisher. So if we go to back to what we saw before with the PubSub Hubbub model where the publisher pushes out to subscribers, let's say we now have unified comment flow from the publisher to all the subscribers. But the subscriber has a new comment on their site. So the subscriber, and one of the people who, who uses the subscriber site, uh, posted a new comment, and we want that shared back and unified with all the subscribers and, and the publisher. So what they'll do is, using the SAM protocol, they'll push that update to the hub, which will in turn be pushed to the publisher. The publisher will then, in turn, integrate the comments into their comment feed, and then push out all those new comments through the hub to all the subscribers, thus unifying the entire comment flow for publishers and subscribers. Now you've significantly increased your outreach channels for social activities. So if you're pushing out content or something through comments, uh, or really just driving up traffic to your site, this is a good way of integrating uh, beyond you, the traditional bounds of your website or service. Now there's a couple of things that you have to consider. Definitely with the Salmon Protocol, it can be quite dangerous if, if not properly implemented. First off, is the content coming from a trusted source? How do you determine that? Do you have a series of public keys that are defined for, the, for a particular subscriber? Do you open it up to everyone and risk getting spam? How do you prevent that spam if, if it does come through? Do you use the, the same filters that you use on your website? Do you have to build other mechanisms, like, uh, other mechanisms to filter out the content? And then finally, how do you ensure quality? How, because you know what your subscribers are like. You know the, the, the people that use your site, what they're like, but you don't know the other sites. Thankfully, there are great open source mechanisms for doing just that and answering these questions. Determining the source and validity of a subscriber using the SAM protocol. First and foremost, what you can do is have the subscriber sign the request with something like um, a unique URI for, for the site, something that belongs to them, or an email address. Then what you can do is use WebFinger that we talked about to, 
to validate the the um, ownership of the email account. So you're you're validating essentially the the host name of the website. Or you can use this other open source technology that's much akin to Webfinger called a link base uh, resource descriptor. And what this is doing is the exact same thing as Webfinger, but on a unique URI. You're determining the owner of a, of a URI. And at the end, uh, the, through discovery of this information, the provider can pull out public keys uh, obtained based on, uh, on the discovery mechanism, so or discovering the uh, username and the user data, and that can determine validity of the source. All right. So we've gone through those, uh, those mechanisms on the social graph and the sharing models. So let's take a look at, at something that's near and dear to my heart, and that's about uh, using work that other companies have already done. Uh, in other words, not reinventing the wheel. What, uh, now, I'm guilty of this myself. I've, I've worked on plenty of projects where I've said, oh, I can build that better any day, and this won't take me long at all, so I'll just do it myself. And my vision is to have this most, the most amazing product. I'm going to reinvent the bike, and it's going to be the best thing the world's ever seen. And in reality, after time cuts and um, not being able to put the effort in and, and really not understanding the overall architecture of the program, this is what I end up with. I end up with a, a horrible version of what I intended to do, and everyone's just crying, and it's horrible. So. Honestly, what we want to do is not reinvent the wheel and use the base level uh, technologies that are already existing on the market, all the hard work that's already been done. All right, with that said, let me take, uh, let me take you through uh, an integration pain I had probably a year and a half ago, two years ago. We're going to call them Company ABC because I, I don't believe in, in saying bad things about companies um, when, when they were, you know, overall failure. And let me pre uh, preface this by saying that if you're in partner integrations and you're integrating a partner and they fail, no matter what happened in that failure, the the blame is to spread not only on the, the user side or the integrators, but it's also on the partner integrations person. So it's as much my fault as their fault in, the, in this integration failure. So I just wanted to state that straight out. So this company was uh, a late round partner for us. They had a, a, a utility application that they were trying to build on the Yahoo application platform. And they were a C-sharp shop, and we offered a whole bunch of SDKs to bypass the pains of OAuth 1. Now, OAuth is a authorization system that allows you to basically have the application access details and, and promote details on, the, on behalf of the user. But uh, we didn't have their available SDK. We didn't have a C-sharp SDK. So what did they do? They took the core C Sharp library that was available on the OAuth code site. They modified it based on whatever their needs were because they wanted to add in additional levels of securities and checks and integration directly within their products. And in doing so, they were creating their own OAuth library. Now, the problem came in when they, when they tried to actually use it and, and integrate it past the OAuth steps. Now, OAuth, is, OAuth 1 was a pain in the butt to begin with. It's hard to integrate with. It's, it's very complex, and the signing is all on the user's behalf, on the person that's integrated. So they went even further and made it even a bigger pain in the butt. So we spent... Um, week and a half trying to get them integrated. We, they would hit some signature issue or some issue with the library. We would do live code reviews and help them through it, help them pass that point, and then they hit another blockade and then come to us. But after a week and a half, they've, they wasted all that time um, on their custom implementation, and they didn't have enough time to finalize the integration of their app. They had only devoted a two-week period to building their app, and by that time, the time was up just getting OWASP working. And this, these are some of the issues that can come into play. Now, this is a major reason why you should be using available software development libraries. Now, Open Social had a open, uh, an open SDK at the time, so we were an open social container, and they had software development kits in C Sharp available, but they didn't want to use that. So they built their own implementation, and the integration failed. 
So this happens time and time again uh, on, on partner integrations and you learn from it. But it's a major reason why you should use open source technologies and technologies that have already been built. Now if we're looking at a great technology that, that showcases this and it showcases this at a very core level, we can see that with the open graph protocol. Now this is something that Facebook uses so readily. It's, it's a major portion of their, their architecture. And it's all based on web semantics. Now, the, if you're familiar with how the semantic web works, uh, or even if you're not, um, it's basically trying to define relevance on a website. So you take a, a root object, let's say a page, and you're defining real characteristics for it. You're, through your normal class structure, your normal markup structure, you're basically defining a way for scrapers or, or people looking at a page um, on, uh, programmatically to drill out the rele relevance of that page, what the main content is, instead of trying to infer it themselves. Within the traditional semantic web, you would have these open source initiatives that would allow you to find class, uh, class structures with specific names, hierarchy in the HTML structure that allowed you to find the, that particular semantic data, such as geodata or, or these vCard data, allowing you to find um, information about the, lo uh, the person or location. And it keeps going on and on. If you take a look at all the, the uh, semantic specifications that are, are available, they are quite extensive. And what the vision was of the semantic web is to have every single customer and every single person on the web with a website or a service to integrate sem the sem semantic markup and thus bringing a new age of enlightenment over the web having complete relevance in a web page where people just know what the core data that a person's trying to get across is on a web page. But in reality, this was the truth of the semantic web. It, it, we had very little adoption. There, there were some sites, some services that did adopt it, but by far and large, it was just another barrier to entry for people. They didn't want to integrate it because it was another step, it's another thing they had to learn. So. Now we have this great new initiative within the Open Graph Protocol that revitalized these standards. And who was it that did that? And you know, that was, that was Facebook. It was definitely Facebook who revived the concepts of behind the semantic web. Through their like button, their share button, so liking something and grabbing that interest relationship for use to basically tell information about a person, or the share button where you're scraping the relevant data from a page in order to share the content. Facebook pushed this new open graph protocol as a standard for the semantic web. When we take a look at what that looks like, it's basically just metadata. You're going to define information like a URL, a title, a, a root image that you should use in order to showcase what the page is. And going further, you can define a lot more technology and a lot more base behind the Open Graph Protocol, like location-based data, video and audio data, as well as more root objects. And since this was an open specification that people can contribute back to, then you could have any objects that you wanted. It was just really a base specification and completely open source world. So it was a, a really great initiative on their behalf uh, to, to integrate their like and share buttons. However, since that metadata is just floating around for every single person that's, that's used or implemented a like or share button or even in their new, in, their new interest graphs or timeline, so anyone that's building applications on timeline is going to integrate some of the same features, some of the same semantics. And there's no reason why we can't use that to our full extent. So sites, millions and millions of sites around the web are integrating these, this metadata and bringing this core relevance back to, to the web. Why can't we leverage off of this? And the simple answer to that is we can. We can use it and we can use the technology and all the effort that Facebook put into doing this. 
And this showcases how, why we should be using it and how we can leverage off of core data that other companies have built. All right, now let's go ahead and, and drill down to another aspect that's, that's usually left um, by the wayside for most implementers, especially when you're building on top of an application container. And that is the concept of building for all available outlets. And by this I mean, build, let's say you're building a social application. You might have different views available to you. You might have a large view for your application, uh, a smaller profile view. You might have a default view that's showed to users when they're logged out or to people visiting the site or a profile of the user. You might have different, different channels for outreach, different mechanisms for the user to, to leverage off of. And these are the outlets that I'm really referring to. And let's start things out by talking, going back to good old Zynga Partnership. I worked so extensively with them over the years that they are, are just really great, a great company to talk about when we're talking about social web. Like them or hate them, they, there's no doubting that they are a leader in social application market. And this, the, what I want to talk about now is, is just the concept of becoming platform agnostic. And in becoming platform agnostic, being able to output for all outlets uh, with very minimal out effort. So in our final integration with Zynga, uh, when we were working on Mafia Wars, Fishville, and, and Poker, we, um, oh, we decided that, that uh, one of the best things with Zynga was to, for them to have a kind of a platform agnostic view. So what they did was have this shim layer in between any sort of social application platform or outlet for their game and their true game servers. So the game content would run on their shim, which would in turn have social linkages to the APIs or structures of the, so any social container that they're linking off of. So what they would do is just run normally and they wouldn't have to put any new effort into the game, wouldn't have to have a proprietary approach depending on whatever application container or, or view that they're implementing. And all they needed to do was link up through the, uh, through the API structures, through iframes or what have you on the social application container. Now in doing so, what they were able to do is, is just put a lot of effort into, into their outreach channels, put a lot of effort into how they're going to drive traffic back to their site and their services. Instead of having to worry, how am I going to fit my game and modify my game so it works on this platform? That's the last thing we want. And a technology that really showcases this is really open social. And open social's viewport, viewports and, and mechanisms for, for uh, building social applications are, are, are a really great driver for the application world. Now, open social is an open specification for building containers and websites, or sorry, building containers and applications on top of those containers. So much like you ha would have with the Yahoo application platform, iGoogle, Orkut, uh, MySpace used to be uh, a, an open social container, still is in whatever iteration it is right now. But we have a lot of a user base behind open social, especially globally where we have a lot of users that, that are building upon this platform and the specification. It has definitely a, this, this core foundation in, in wanting to teach how to build applications and containers. We have Shindig, which is a practical implementation of the open social spec, allowing you to uh, build out a container on top of this platform. It's an Apache project that you can just uh, install and, and basically start building up your social linkages and allowing applications to be built on the platform. And going further, there's a uh, Google Code project called Partuza. I believe it was created by one of the Google developer advocates. And it showcases a real implementation of a social container built on top of Shindig. So if you take a look for the, these projects, these will all teach you so much about building social applications and containers from a nitty gritty detail. Uh, from social media channels to making remote procedural calls and, and really what that means. So 
it's a good foundation language and really what's, what's a good driver for um, the concept of building for all outlets. So if we take the fundamentals behind Open Social, Open Social defines a, it, that an application may have a series of views. So where people will see the application and we want context. We have the home view, which is the person goes to their own personal profile that only they can see, they see a larger version of the application. You have your profile view where if other users go to your profile, the, you, they would see a small, that small application. Now if they have the application installed, they'll see one thing. If they don't have it installed, they'll see a default slate. Then you have the concept of a full, uh, full outlook or a full view. And these are really the full view application taking up the, all the browser space. So if we have these coupled with default slates or logged out states, we're building for a lot of views. And time and time again, I have worked with partners and developers who just want to focus on that full view because it has all the capabilities that they want. It's not strict at all like a profile view might or home view. Uh, it, it's, has user states like the default view wouldn't have, but they're losing so much viral growth by not building for these views because people will use whatever view they want. They might want to only interact with a small version of the app. They might want to see a compacted view and have that customization ability. They, and nine times out of ten, they might not want to always have to go to that full view in order to do anything with their application. Now, when we've seen companies like Zynga integrating with all these different views, they've seen an incredible amount of viral growth back to their application. So this holds true with views of an application itself. It also holds true with activities that you're pushing out to other streams. So if we take a look at that concept, we can take a look at another technology called activity streams. Really what activity streams is, is a platform agnostic way of defining an activity. So I like something, or I posted something on my wall, or um, I, uh, I posted this link. All of these are activities that a user can do, or activities a user has done. And activity streams is really just a JSON or, or Atom specification which which defines this, this actor object um, type of model to define an activity. And since these are platform agnostics, uh, platform agnostic, they can be integrated everywhere. They can go from platform to platform as long as the specification is integrated. Open Social as a specification, as a version 2.0, has integrated activity streams into their core specification. So it's definitely an emerging technology that's worth keeping an eye out in the social space. Okay, now as we wrap up, let's take a look at one of the great topics on, on using emerging social technologies and emerging technologies to improve, uh, improve the growth of your applications. I'm going to spit out an old adage here. The early bird gets the worm. Uh, we've, I'm sure we've all heard and are sick of hearing it at this point, but it holds so true with emerging technologies. And the simple fact is, by the time the system greens popularity or the time you, that you even notice it, um, you, you might already be too, too late. Your chances of making headway into those systems or using that technology are already too late. Uh, you're going to get buried under the masses of, of the technology spectrum of other application developers. Let's take Facebook's new timeline, for instance. Um, we have, uh, when they were launched at F8 recently, they had a series of application partners. These application partners had already built on top of the, on top of the timeline. Now, those were some core people who, or core companies that integrated with these emerging technologies and took risks. You know, Facebook's a no-brainer at this time, but let's take a look at you know, uh, other platforms see, integrating with some of their technologies. You, you absolutely need to take risks in the space. You need to be able to, to push the boundaries of what you're doing to improve your lives and the life, uh, lives of your users, making it easier for them to develop on top of your platforms or, or to work with your systems and, or to socialize with them and drive traffic back. 
can't really get away from the, the fact that, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm touting all these use cases about where, where I worked in, uh, when I worked in YDN and the Yahoo Developer Network without actually talking about issues with the Yahoo Developer Network itself. Now, the, I'm over at XCommerce now, so I'm definitely not there anymore, and all, all of my colleagues that I, I worked with are not there anymore. Now, there's a reason behind that, and this is actually the first time I've ever talked about this, but it has such great relevance towards this topic in the fact that you're never too big to fail. So the Yahoo Developer Network was a great initiative to be a front face of the company of Yahoo. But it really didn't get the funding or the, um, really the backing that it needed. The problems that we had were that we had a failure to move quickly on, on new technologies and, and really to adopt. So we became followers. We started seeing trends in the market, and when they succeeded, we integrated. Um, and we integrated with Yahoo Security. Security was of paramount importance for, uh, for the, uh, the core architecture teams. And for those of you who have worked with systems like Kaha, which is a front-end security, a front-end code secure that rewrites all your code, it makes it incredibly difficult to work with systems. And you know, at, at the end of the day, if you're if you have a, a secure system or pushing security and it's impeding innovation, you failed. And what we we noticed was that we were going down that route. Security was impeding the innovation aspects. And the backing just wasn't there. We weren't seen as a technology leader in, in the pack. We were followers. We uh, developed these uh, core technologies like the, our application platform years after the, uh, the core MySpace, Facebooks, uh, all built theirs, uh, you know, iGoogle or, or Orkut. And, and the space just wasn't relevant. It, it's very hard to get gains in there. And if you do get gains, you have to offer something that no one else has. And that eventually led to um, the Yahoo Devel Developer Network being almost dissolved and the people who worked on these, these core products migrating to different groups and different roles or eventually just leaving the company. Now, yeah, Yahoo is still a great, com a great company to work for, very talented people there, but I need, uh, I need to relate the stories behind the Yahoo Developer Network in order to get some context behind the fact that you're never too big to fail, no matter what. So let's take a look at one more poll before, uh, just to wrap things up. How many of the companies or technologies that you guys work with, how, how much do you actually allot time for emerging technologies to explore them, uh, to, to really just um, you know, see what's out there and what can be useful for you? So definitely go ahead, uh, publish your answers, and we'll, I'll just give you a quick moment there, and then we'll, we'll take a look at what the results are. All right. All right. So oh, this is awesome. Uh, almost 80% of you have said that yes, your companies actually actively engage in emerging technologies, and this this is an amazing thing because years ago this wasn't true. You just did what you've always done. You've, you've built on the products that have always been tried and true. But what you're seeing now is that companies who do not innovate, do not innovate falter and eventually fail because they can't keep up. Um, I know myself within developer evangelism, I spend um, amazing amounts of time just keeping up on technology just to keep myself relevant, and that's a daily job. Companies have to go even further than that and to not only explore these technologies, but see how relevant they are for their space. All right, so let's take a look at some of the technologies that, that really showcase this. OAuth 1. OAuth 1 was, was really quite an amazing feat at, at its time. When it was first released, it was this really nice auth, uh, authorization system that 
allowed applications to um, basically ask the user to grant them permissions to access their data on their behalf or publish data to their activity stream, so, or basically do, thing, do things without their constant involvement. It was uh, it, it implemented a, this great signing mechanism um, that really push, it was pushed on the user. So the person implementing would have to, um, have to build in the signature code on their, si on their own side. It was quite difficult, as I've mentioned already in this, uh, in this webcast. And at the, at the end of the day, it, did be, it was a very lengthy process, and people wanted to innovate on top of that. But you saw countless companies jumping on board of this, this authorization system to really start integrating with it because they saw the value of it over, uh, over let's say, using a username and password. So with a username and password, you would access or give that, those credentials to an application and they could use it whenever they want on your behalf. And you're not really sure which applications at the end of the day that you've granted permissions to unless you've kept track. Now with OAuth, you were able to uh, see through the root container that, or the root service that you're using that these, uh, these services were all available, that, that uh, all these applications were accessing your data, and you can revoke the access. Then you had improvement in the space with OAuth 2. OAuth 2 really drove home that you can have security and adoption. So I first started integrating with this with Facebook, Google, and, uh, and Gowalla when they started their OAuth implementations. First time through, I was reading the documentation, and 15 minutes later, I had a practical implementation working in OAuth 2. That's by far so much quicker and so much easier than OAuth 1 because they removed the signing mechanism. They removed all the need to, to, uh, for the user to go through incredible pains. So you have this communication channel over HTTPS, and it made, adopt it made adoption of the platform easy. And Facebook's using it as their main mechanism for, for authorizing apps and for, also for authenticating users. And, and at the end of the day, we're, we're showing that these emerging technologies, the only value is if they give back to, uh, to the adoption of your platform. So if you want to integrate users, you want to drive viral growth, you need to find technologies that make the lives of your developers and yourself easier. And this is really the only way that these emerging social open source technologies can really gain the relevance that they need. So that's pretty much the end of it. That's uh, um, all the steps that I wanted to cover on, on just some of the, the major things that I've noticed in the, in the industry. And uh, uh, let me see what we have for questions. <laughs> all right. Going over here. Uh, so uh, Larry Fickles, uh, sorry if I mispronounced that name, um, had a question. Do you need the skills of a back-end web application developer to integrate social apps into your website? Absolutely not. You, uh, you can imp uh, definitely integrate um, systems like uh, Partuza. Partuza is very, uh, very quite uh, easy to implement, and that will give you a base level social container. Um, open source uh, social uh, allows you to build applications within XML and JavaScript. So J using those two mechanisms, you can, um, you can definitely build applications. Um, uh, let's see, Elio asked, how do you get an x.com email address? Well, you have to work for xcommerce. Um, we come from, so we had the x.com domain for quite a while, and we eventually decided to use it as the developer network presence for eBay, PayPal, and Magento, and that's how we got, uh, got x.com. Uh, let's see. Oh. Uh, okay. Do we have any other questions? We do, Jonathan. One just came in from Randy, and Randy asks, can you focus on a hypothetical on how I take my little site and get it socially integrated? 
Okay, well, there's, there's different mechanisms that you can utilize to socially integrate your site. So, uh, let's see, the major outlet channels I would say for social integration would probably be Twitter. Uh, Twitter, uh, you can use their OAuth integration to push out channels there. Now, uh, you can also use Facebook integration, so um, what you can do is have a Facebook share button. Also keep on, on top of, of um, the Facebook timeline because what, um, what Facebook's doing when they release this to uh, all application developers so that you can push out, uh, push out your applications is you can build on top of their timeline and once the user authorizes your application, you can push anything you want to their timeline on their behalf. And this is going to allow you to enhance their social experience and drive traffic back to your site. Now if you want to integrate uh, commenting flow uh, onto your site, PubSub Hubbub is a great mechanism for allowing, uh, or allowing you to, um, to socialize your app through uh, other content or publisher sites. There are um, companies like Superfeeder who have a hosted hub solution which, which is uh, uh, free for, uh, that you can use uh, for a, you know, a, small amount of, uh, a small amount of data and uh, that will allow you to not have to build a hub solution yourself. So you just have to have a publisher and a subscriber and that's also a good way of, of socializing. Be very careful when you socialize your application not to give too many options to the user. They get overwhelmed very quickly, and it's good just to have the major players that, that they're familiar with. Perfect, thank you. That's all the questions I see that have come in. Did you have anything further for our attendees today, Jonathan? Um, no, that, well, that's pretty much it. If um, I just also wanted to mention that um, XCommerce has an Innovate conference coming up on October 12th to 14th. Uh, if you go to innovate-conference.com, you can see it there. I'll be doing a book signing at the O'Reilly booth at 5.30 on uh, the 12th if you want to come by and get a book. I'll also be talking about some really innovative things that that's the um, eBay, PayPal, and Ma Magento folks within XCommerce are doing around identity. So they're making identity relevant and much more relevant through mechanisms like OpenID for commerce platforms. So I'm going to be talking a lot about that at, at the conference. So if you're definitely going to be there, um, you know, drop by, the, drop by that talk. Uh, if you are not sure you can make it or you need help with the tickets, uh, feel free to email me and I'm sure we can hook you up with something. Thank you very Wonderful. much, everyone.